Welcome to another episode of Reason for Truth, where listen, the truth comes first and the reasons come last, but where we're always and constantly learning because, listen, when we stop learning, we stop teaching or at least stop teaching well. Today's truth is simply that anxiety is real. It's physical. It's physiological. It's spiritual. But listen, God's bigger and he's going to help us. And God's raised up an army, but some very special people in this world to help overcome. And that's what we're going to do today. Today, we want us to talk about really anxiety and uh, with special guest, Edwina Reyes. And she has more letters than I do by far, MFT, CSAC, CSATS, and it goes on. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified substance abuse counselor. Edwina is also a sex addiction counselor, the only sex, uh, the only sexual addiction counselor in the state of Hawaii. So you can imagine she's very busy. I got to know Edwina a little bit on social network and uh, very godly lady, sticks to the word of God, but also understands humans in the way that uh, God's called her to do. Edwina, thank you. Welcome to Reason for Truth. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me here. You're welcome. Today, we want to cover really what God's Word tells us about um, really anxiety, because I think we've got so many problems going on right now, especially with everything with COVID and just um, all the trauma that's being caused from people locked in their house, losing their jobs. I know that as well, you're a drug counselor and um, and a certified e- EMDR therapist. So with Life Consulting Inc. and I and I and I know that at the end of the day, the numbers for addiction on, on drugs, you know, are way up. So, but I want to jump right in here. I have a number of questions that I want to relate them to anxiety, and then see what God's Word as well has to say. But, uh, it, Edwina, where what's the core? Where does anxiety come from to begin with? Um, that's a really good cr- uh, question, um, Stephen. A lot of times people actually get this part confused, but anxiety actually. Um, is something that can be very, uh, it can come from actually multiple um, sources, you know, uh, hereditary, that's what I notice a lot, hmm. uh, stress, ongoing chronic stress especially, um, trauma, sometimes people have, um, or PTSD, sometimes people are raised already in very um, abusive, very violent households, um, and sometimes after that, they have other events in their life that occur, and uh, stress is something that compounds, trauma is something that also compounds as well too. It's just as time goes on, as a person gets older, it just worsens their state as well, too, and and their ability and the ways to cope. Um, Substance abuse addiction as well, too. Addictions in general is is a a huge factor as well, too, into anxiety. And, you know, overall, you know, being a Christian as well, too, Stephen, honestly, it's really a sin nature as well, too. It's the brokenness of man for the beginning of time. You know, and so, so for the beginning of time already, we're always starting to be broken, and uh, anxiety is just a manifestation of that, really. No, that's a great answer, man. I, 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 it never ceases to amaze me every time I watch your videos. It, and it, it, I don't say this that often. I really mean that. I always learn something. Uh, I mean, you said a few things there. I had no idea that anxiety was really. Um, had anything to do with genetics. I mean, my my father had heart disease, and you know the oh, doctor yeah. I went to see a cardiologist the other day. And he said, "Listen, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you picked a bad dad." He's not criticizing my dad, <laughs> but it's hereditary, is what he say. You know, so it is what it is. But I had no idea. Uh, but yeah. that's a great. It's great uh, to understand. I think it kind of helps us better, and perhaps how we'll treat it. But let me ask this question: What's the difference between worry, common worry, and anxiety? Good. Very good. So yes, a lot of people think it's actually one and the same, but there's actually a actually quite a bit of a difference between the two, you know. And so, um, worry is something that's definitely more cognitive, right? It, it's it's more hmm. in the way an individual process through some process through a problem or issue or a stressful event, whereas anxiety is something that is actually way way more uh, physiological. It's really a physical reaction that we have to stress. Um, it's also, a lot of people don't realize this too, but it's also a very subconscious reaction that we also have. So a lot of times we're not, we're not even completely aware of it because we're just going, going, going with whatever is happening at that moment. And we don't take the moment to realize how our body is actually reacting to that situation. Mm. So it's, anxiety is actually very, very visceral, right? And when, when I learned this being a trauma expert myself, that trauma in itself actually affects every single cell of your body. Wow. Right? With a traumatic event, right? It is really hmm. an effect. 
your whole body. And so when you think of anxiety, anxiety being visceral, being physiological, it is the same thing too. We feel it through our whole bodies as well too when we go through anxiety, which is why over time, when someone has anxiety that is not controlled, uncontrolled, after some time, and if the person is chronically in that state, uh, it leads eventually to panic attacks and then chronic panic attacks. Which is oftentimes, unfortunately, when someone starts to seek out help. Wow. You said something again that stuck with me. <clears throat> I didn't tell the whole story. Yes. My other episodes have. So my father passed when I was five. Leaving my mom with my sister was uh, about a week old. They were just home from the hospital. And my mom is now stuck out of the blue raising four children. And she ended up uh, contracting leukemia three years later. And she said growing up, she always said, and to this day she says that because she was cured by God's grace. Different story. But she said it was really the stress and the anxiety of just all of a sudden being thrown, you know, all of a sudden you're going, you've got four kids, you're living three and a half hours from your parents and you've got to, and they were in New York City, we were in Washington, D.C. area in Maryland. And, uh, but I can see that anxiety, you know, I, I like what you said in terms of worry. Worry seems to be a temporal thing. We worry when, uh, oh no, hold on a second, that I put the garage door down. Anxiety, like you said, is more, seems to be more deep-seated. I think about King David, you know, being... <laughs> You know, he probably had times of worry, but when you're being chased up and down the mountains, I think that's a little bit more in line with anxiety because you can't really even get that good of sleep with one eye open and uh, knowing, wondering if your job's going to fall from one level, you know, with the shoe's going to fall and uh, today's world's very uncertain. But interesting. I appreciate that answer. Let me ask this question. What does scripture say about anxiety? There's a lot of scriptures. I'm not going to go into them, but I want to hear your perspective because you are a, a, a very accomplished and a very good counselor, but you're also a Christian. So what does the Bible, what does the scripture say about anxiety? I'm also, Stephen, very, very practical in nature, you know, and I, and I try to simplify things for a lot of people so they can st understand, especially if you're a new believer, a new Christian. Mm. And so in the most simplest form, when I talk to my own patients about about um, anxiety, um, I really reference back um, into the New Testament a lot, especially Jesus' words and, and Paul's words, Apostle Paul's words as well, too. And what do they say about it? And so, you know, um, Matthew 6, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus talks about, you know, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. You know, today has enough trouble of its own. Mm. You know, that's a famous one that a lot of us uh, am, are aware of. And, you know, and in, in that scripture, when we look at those, that, that passage area or that kind of like that, that theme of Matthew 6, we can kind of see and know that God takes care of us, right? Mm. He takes care of everything that surrounds us. And, and there's a reassurance in that when Jesus says, like, hey, look, I've, it's almost like I've got you, right? Like, I've got, I've got the lilies of the field. I've got the birds in the air, right? Why do you not think that I'm not going to take care of you, right? So basically, that's what he's really saying. And so, and I love it because, you know, the more I learn about mental health, the more I realize how much Jesus' words are actually so true. And in this anxiety, you know, the scripture about worry, um, um, what's so fundamental about it is 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 this particular passage of Matthew 6 34 that I just kind of recited over here um, really goes to to help people to understand that you got to just focus in the here and now mm. in the moment don't think about the past don't think about the future just take care mm. of what is or just focus on what's in the here and now right and what's in the present moment right and that's Jesus's words and when you look at psychology and what's being taught now in the world, that's what they say, right? Mindfulness, being grounded, being here in the moment. Um, another scripture, folks in reference, uh, Apostle Paul, one of my very favorites, Philippians 4, 6, he says, uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And in that, you know, for me, when I read that, and what Apostle Paul is saying mm. really is like, again, you know, you're worried or you're anxious or you're stressed, you know, take that before the Lord. Let him kind of help you with that. And so that's just a few scriptures. And again, these are popular scriptures, but they really help someone who is battling with anxiety. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I remember to go on with the story. 
I remember because my mom had come home after six months in the hospital, and I do remember that Matthew scripture, and I can remember it like it's yesterday, Edwina, and reading it and believing it. It'd say, listen, God clothes the little, you know, the lilies, he feeds the birds, and how much more? We're created in his image, and that is he going to take care of us. And you know, that was many moons ago. Mom's still alive, thank God. But I tell you what, God still shows up and does that. And I still sometimes get worried, <laughs> but that goes back to the human nature part, you know? Oh gosh. So let me ask a question. What are some practical ways, as you just said, what are some practical ways that we can, you think, manage our anxiety kind of in this crazy time in history we find ourselves in? Oh, absolutely. So, so this is something that I do oftentimes with a lot of my patients, you know, so just going back to that uh, Matthew six, right? Scripture on, you know, like focusing on today. Um, that's what I really do with folks is I help them to focus on the moment. So how do you do that? So the first thing I really teach a lot is, is I actually teach something called grounding, right? So a lot of people wonder, okay, what exactly is grounding? And, and there's really, when it comes to grounding skills, there are three different areas that are kind of key. Uh, because everyone is different, you really got to find uh, what works best for you. Uh, the, the three different kinds of grounding skills are mental, uh, physical, and soothing. So the mental things that folks can do, especially when they're battling anxiety, and, and to keep you in the here and now, in the present moment, it could be things like saying safety statements to yourself, like, you're okay, this, this stress, stressful event is just for now, this is not going to be for tomorrow, you'll survive this, and we're going to be able to move forward this. Or it could be things like counting, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Um, or it could even be like, you know, let's just say if you're in a car and you're feeling really anxious, uh, count um, how many blue Hondas you can find on the road. Uh, you know, things like that. So that's just some examples of mental. Second, physical. Uh, physical grounding skills is something, uh, Stephen, that really works for me. Um, it could, it's, it's, it's walking and, and being just, and paying close attention to the steps that you take. Uh, it could even be washing your face with cold water or hands when you're feeling very anxious. Hmm. Uh, deep breathing. It's also part of physical deep breathing, slow, deep abdominal breathing is probably ultimately the best way to manage anxiety when you when you feel it coming. Really? Up. I did not know that. Exactly. Because the reason why is when you do tr true abdominal breathing, and so the best way to actually do that is to actually lay flat on your back because you cannot do chest breathing, right? You really truly learn how to breathe through, from your abdomen when you're flat on your back. And you just take really slow breaths, really slow breaths, hmm. going out. That's the quickest and fastest way, actually, to kind of get your your anxiety down. And the reason why is when you abdominal breathe, what happens is oxygen actually goes throughout your whole entire body. Ah. Which down. So that's physical. Third one is soothing. Soothing are things like um, are that's like scripture reading, right, or listening to worship music. Uh, looking at photos, anything that, or even um, reading uh, um, uh, lyrics, right, to a song that you really enjoy. Anything that can soothe and relax you is also wonderful ways to ground you. So those are some three key things. Yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, it's, it's great because I've done some of those things. You brought a lot of clarity there. I, I just remember, I'm old, not that old, but I'm old enough where... You know, they used to say, hey, hold on, just slow down. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. And, you know, you, you, you know, allegorically, I guess speaking, you're thinking they're the same, relax. But there's, I guess, a lot more truth to that, right? There's a lot more truth. Oh. Yes, absolutely. Um, and the other thing I want to say, again, very, very practical, because I'm very a practical person, <laughs> is um, mad, people can also manage anxiety by, by being uh, cautious of also what they eat. There's actually certain foods out there that actually spike up your anxiety, and there's also hmm. foods out there actually bring down your anxiety. What are some like, of the worst? <laughs> oh, okay, so a lot of people are not going to like hearing this, but the absolute worst thing actually for anxiety is actually caffeine. Okay. So coffee. Yeah, for example, coffee. Um, I didn't want to hear that, but oh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. A lot of people don't like that news, right? Um, uh, I, I got to tell you, I, I wish I could snapshot the pictures on their faces when I tell people that, you know, like they're like, oh, no, right? And I said, no, I'm so sorry for the bad news, but yes. Caffeine, coffee is the absolute worst thing for anxiety, right? Because you got to think about naturally what caffeine does to us, right? Yeah, sure, body, sure. And then you think of anxiety affecting the body, so the two and two kind of go hand in hand. So 
first thing off the list, off the list for people, my patients that I work with is, okay, we're going to have to stop your caffeine and caffeine if you want to stop your panic attacks. And so, um, and when you're desperate, you just got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things. Um, the best thing though, that, that someone can let us say eat to calm that anxiety. And like, again, a lot of people don't realize this is actually when you're in a state of anxiety and stress, eat two bananas. Really? Two bananas. Yeah, it's really weird. I, I realize that. Blend them if you have to into a smoothie. But the reason why is when, you, again, uh, anxiety, it's your body, right? It's physiological. Bananas are actually really miracles for anxiety because, number one, they're potassium packed. Right. That's what I was wondering. Helps you, right, to manage your blood pressure, everything. It brings it down. And it's also, and it's also considered like a beta blocker, which really oh. kind of blocks basically the adrenaline, which is like our stress hormones from coming in and affecting our body. So you eat two bananas, your body will actually relax and calm down. That's, that's absolutely amazing. We, we, when we, I've been scuba diving since I was 13 and, you know, we take it for cramps and yes. you, you know, and, but I, I was listening to one of your other programs on insomnia and then you, you taught me something I thought was really revolutionary for me, which is uh, tight muscles create insomnia. And I, I thought insomnia created tight muscles. That's what it was. Okay. And so, yeah. So, you know, because I couldn't figure out. I've been a couple times where I, I work out at the gym and, and I'll, you know, sometimes I'll be really um, sore and I'll get up in the middle of the night. If I have to, I'll take just one to leave and I, I go to sleep and I'm like, man, I slept like a baby. I don't want to get up in the morning. I'm all relaxed. And I'm like, how did that happen? Um not to say to use it as a sleep aid, I guess you could. Uh, but, but having said that, I like what you said earlier in terms of, uh, so I do have coffee in the morning, a big cup, mm -hmm. and then I have a cup of decaf and then oh, by yeah. about 10 o'clock and then I'm done. But what I do do, to be honest with you, is I go to the gym in the afternoon mm -hmm. and I tell yeah. you what, it drains the sugars. It takes all that out. And, um, and then so I'm not as fast when I come back, but then I, I, tell my, uh, my, you know, I tell everyone I work at human speeds, you know, and, but I think without that, you're right. You're just putting sugar, you're putting caffeine in your body. You have to really balance that out of, you got to do something or you're going to end up with greater problems, but appreciate that. Does having anxiety mean that we, you know, do you think that we don't trust God? Do you think it's lack of faith or we aren't reading or praying enough reading the Bible? You know, that's a really good, good question, right? And that's something that I, I, I see so often. You know, a lot of my patients, right, are referred by their churches or their pastors or their leaders to come and see me. And so, um, and a lot of times by the time they hit my office, right, they're, you know, aside from having anxiety, they're also wondering about their own Christian walk as well too, right? Like, yes. It, if there's something I'm doing wrong over here, you know? Um, and that's not just for the new Christian. That's also for the very well-seasoned ones as well too. And um, so I really try to rest assured folks, and I say that, you know, like, anxiety, again, because it's phys physiological, there's going to be so many underpinnings to it, right? It, you have to look at it s separate, right, from, from your relationship with Christ, right? Because I work with a lot of people who have just phenomenal um, um, devotional lives, right? They're very dedicated in church, in their prayer, their scriptures, but they still suffer, right? Mm. They still suffer from anxiety. Um, it, you got to look at the two things very differently. And so, and you gotta almost like treat it differently as well too. Mm. But what happens sometimes with, uh, uh, I think, uh, church uh, leaders or pastors, what happens is they kind of combine it all, and they kind of see it as okay, if if you're still if you're still having anxiety, that means that you're not praying enough, you're not reading enough, you're mm. not putting enough into your devotional life. But when what, but they're not looking at the other, again, like we talked in the very beginning, right? Uh, where does anxiety come from, right? Right. I mean, that, kind of the magical question if it's something that's hereditary or if it comes from let's just say if there's a woman and she was sexually abused growing up for let's just say majority of her childhood life right uh her whole body already doesn't feel safe and now she attends church she becomes a christian let's just say she didn't tie in yet that right it's let's just say she didn't tie in her anxiety with the sexual abuse she goes to church she prays she still feels a lot of anxiety because her body is already accustomed to not feeling safe then the pastor might tell her, what is wrong with you, right? Like, like you're not reading enough. She's like, I am reading, I'm, you know, again, because there's a different situation there that has to be addressed, right? Right, sure. But, and it, and it, maybe she is going to, like, the the deliverance prayers, deliverance or seeing the deliverance team at church, 
um, you know, taking sometimes those cleansing classes, uh, generational inequities, breaking those sins of the past, but still struggling because it's not just that work alone that has to be done. There's other things as well too. No, sure. So realize too that you can't just target only one area and expect freedom and victory. When you're really looking at wellness and wholeness as a whole, you gotta look at all the areas, right? Your physical, your mental, your emotional, your spiritual. You really cannot neglect one or the other. You gotta pay attention to all. So, uh, trusting God, believing God, loving God, uh, and your Christian walk and anxiety, you gotta look at the two different. Hey Amen. That's a great answer because I think a lot of people struggle with that. You know, they go to church, they hear, "Hey, just you know, listen, you give it over to God. Did you pick it back up?" And it's you know, it's not faith and I mean, there's some truth to that, but by the same token, I think it'd be helpful for us to implement exactly those areas and to be more effective in our spiritual life to understand that we are made physical, physiological, and psychological, and, and to help with those things, ground all that in Scripture. It's a great, great thing. I appreciate that. Let me ask you a question, Edwina. Is it wrong for a Christian to see a psychologist? Do you think a medical, you know, like a medical doctor, or is it wrong for a Christian to turn to psychiatric, you think, medications uh, for relief of symptoms and, and anxiety? You know, I'll, I'll tell you that I think the worst of the situation is to not get help at all. Hmm. And so, you know, to me, I, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, um, you know, God made and created, you know, medical doctors, uh, Christian psychiatrists, um, even mental health professionals like myself, you know, for a reason. Again, going back to the brokenness of the world, right? Yeah. Uh, sometimes for people from the start of their birth, it, it, they're already having a really bad start. Um, maybe already, uh, genetics, right? They're already having, um, um, they're, the way their brains have been developed, uh, maybe they're creating low dopamine levels, serotonin mm -hmm. levels in the brain. And so, and, and that's, for some folks, that's nothing that they can control, you know? So, um, especially when there's hormonal imbalances or imbalances on the brain, um, or let's just say you just go through event after event, it's not wrong to seek help because sometimes for some people that are out there, the only way for them to come to any sort of stabilization or normalcy is to, is to seek out um, psychiatric medications. Mm -hmm. um, really, when it comes to a point where a person can't sleep, they can't eat, uh, they can't go to work, they're having a hard time um, taking care of their children, functioning in just daily life, um, it is best to seek help. You know, I think of it like um, if a person had, let's just say, cancer, right? Um, you're going to go see the doctor. Right. You're going to go see the psychologist. You know, you might seek out a, a, a nutritionist or a specialist or a naturopath for help. You know, why? Because it's beyond just you and you're going to know when you have something like cancer, you're going to need additional help. Hmm. Mental health, anxiety, it's the same thing. Yes. You know, what you're struggling with. Get the help that you need. What advice do you give to someone, really, who's been, let's say, doing all the right things? They've been doing all these things. They've been praying, reading their Bible, uh, meditating, worshiping, attending church, listen, involved with their church, uh, involved with small group, but they're still struggling, you know, which is anxiety and the symptoms of anxiety. What, what, what say you then? You know, the best thing that you can do is, especially when you're a church goer, leader, member of a church, and you see someone who's struggling, is to really listen. First of all, listen to them. Believe mm. them, right? Let them tell their story. Um, the one thing I do get saddened, if not just sad and angry about, you know, is is people when they do spiritual shaming in the church, right? Like, you know, like you didn't do this enough. You didn't do that enough. Did you do this? Did you do that? Right? All it does is it just makes a person feel like I'm not good enough or I didn't right. do enough. So you, you want to avoid that. You want to love on the person. You want to let them know you believe them. You're there for them. You're going to support them. Um, you don't have to have the answer. It's okay. You know, if you don't have the answer and someone's struggling, you know, just being there with them, be honest with them. Man, I don't know what's going on with you, but you know what? I'm going to be praying with you. Yes. I want to, I want to help you. Uh, let's, let me see if I can find some resources that can assist you. Um, and, and just really being there for them is probably the greatest gift hmm. that you can that you can give to someone. That's what Dr. Dobson said. Uh, it stuck with me for life. It's a major cornerstone in my life, and that's be there. That's the, you know you don't have to, you're never going to be a perfect friend. You're never going to be a perfect mom, perfect dad, perfect spouse, perfect mom or dad, whatever. Just be there. That's ninety percent of the equation, and just trying to love on people 
and uh, that's ninety percent of life, right? So, and I think that's one of the in our colder, godless society. I think that's one of the reasons why we're having so many issues we do is because, as my mother would say, we have the blind leading the blind. You have people with major hurts, right, that are that are perpetuating this. And, you know, they don't. And that's why when we were talking earlier before we started a situation and as much as somebody may make you angry and you can see major dysfunction, like major dysfunction, you kind of have to pity them from the perspective that they just don't have what it takes to be good. And, you know, I come from the old school a little bit where at some point, you know, you give them the truth that you hope to so, you know, yeah, I could tell my kids that all the time. It hurts me, as my mom said, it hurts me more than you to discipline you. But I'm going to give it to you because you need to get it. By the same token, you know, you don't want to exacerbate your child or you don't want to you don't want to break their spirit to the point unless it's a really bad spirit. But but, you know, you want you want to you want to help along. Be patient. Be patient. Uh, you know, I just wrote uh, one of my third book was um, uh, uh, equipped basic training and apologetics for evangelism. And it, there was a, a gentleman in my life who uh, really helped uh, put the heart into that. And the sense that, you know, he comes from a, a, a fairly, it is, I know his background, I know his, his dad, great guy, love him to death. But, you know, you have to understand that's the upbringing that he was up, you know what I'm saying? I had my upbringing that if we all have, so I call that empathy. And when we fail to have empathy, Edwina, I think we fail to exhibit what the scriptures say. It, you know, there's doesn't mean we're not called to stand on the truth. That is for sure. But we're also called to have empathy. And when Jesus draw the in the sand with his finger, you know, who left first? The older ones. Why? Because they've been around long enough to realize we're honest with themselves that, listen, they too are not perfect. And so um, how does anxiety e- exhibit in children and teens and what can a parent do to help their child and i want to tell you a brief story you know what do, should parents be looking for at what at what point should a parent seek help for their child i didn't realize this you know i just grew up in a different era i never saw anxiety and i think the world was a different place for, in great part from that but i went on a retreat maybe 300 middle and high schoolers and any given time there was anywhere from two to five and they told me that any given time, there's two to five kids back here having panic attacks. And I'm thinking, I don't, I don't like, why? It was very opening, eye-opening for me. And I think we probably had duress when I was there. But I think the world just seems to be a whole level of stress, Edwina. But how does anxiety, again, exhibit itself, in, especially in our teens and our children, um, even younger than? And how, you know, what can a parent do to help their child? And what they should be, what should they be looking out for? in their child uh this is a part that is uh, a little bit scary and a little bit tricky so i'm gonna do my best to answer this uh and the reason why i say that is you know some of my patients uh just in general uh including um children and teens uh, who have a, who exhibit and who i can tell have the highest level of anxiety mm. you cannot see it from the outside per se you can't see it because because it is so physiological because it's, it affects the body uh, some of the people that have who have the greatest level of anxieties, they look like the calmest people ever on the outside. Right? <laughs> they talk slow. They're still. They're not shaking. Right? They look perfectly normal and fine. But you don't realize that though in their bodies, they're actually going 150 miles per hour as far as stress, anxiety, worry, fears, and everything else in between. Yes. So, I, I yeah. So and for, then it, yeah. Yeah. So for a parent, that can be tricky, right? Because you're going to look at your child and go, okay, they look fine. They look normal, right? But actuality, something is actually not right. So the best thing as a parent that you can really do is to regularly check in on your children, Mm. right? Make sure you don't just look at them. Okay, they're not bleeding. Nothing's going on, right? They they seem fine. They're okay. And and just neglect that. No, spend some time to really talk with them, especially with this um, COVID-19 and everything that's going on. Mm. you know, this season of time, I have heard, uh, and people who are closer to me, that their child had committed suicide. Yes. And, uh, and I, I didn't even hear what I've heard several, right? Which is just, I mean, being a parent as well, too, a teenager and, and, a, and a young adult child, it really broke my heart tremendously to hear that. Mm. And, um, and I hear the same thing that for some of these stories that I've heard about their, their teenage child who committed suicide, um, they seemed perfectly fine. There were no obvious symptoms to the parents they were doing well in school 
And then one next thing you know, boom, they find their child dead. Mm. And wow. so, um, so what happens? So, so again, because it affects the, the body, um, a lot, again, the, the child might be suffering, the parents don't know, check in with your child, right? How are you doing? How is your school? And, and dig in, right? Like, how are things with your friends, right? How are things with your relationships? Um, go there, ask the hard questions, right? Dig in deeper, get to know your child more. Um, and also find out, you know, be pay attention to their sleeping habits and their eating habits as well too. Pay attention if they're having a hard time sleeping because all of those are going to be signs as well too if something all of a sudden is thrown off. But again, they might be minute. And so as a parent, you really have to pay attention to yes. what, what yes. to be able to Amen. But, Being in touch um, with your children, knowing what's going on in their life, right? You have to. Otherwise, it can bypass you. And that's going to be very dangerous. Yes. So, so as a parent, you know, you're, you're going to have to really dig in and ask the questions. Yeah, I appreciate it. One last question for you. For church group leaders, pastors, ministers, I, I, a lot of friends there. What's the best way for them to support someone in their church or ministry who suffers from anxiety? Aside from like we talked about earlier, like support listening, you know, the best thing I think the church can do is if they can create, some churches here locally have created resources that they actually can hand out to um, their parishioners or their attendees, right? So whether it's a list of, of therapists that they know, um, or even um, one of the best things that I've ever witnessed and seen uh, in my offices is where some of their some of their Bible study group leaders or church pastors have actually volunteered and gone with my patients to their first visit. Oh, wow, okay. They come in. Now, they don't come into the office. They just hang out in the waiting room. But just the fact that the presence is there. Yeah, absolutely. It, it goes back to be there. It's what it does. Be, be there. Exactly how you said, right? Be there, right? And, um, and, you know, and there's a comfort that that person has who's struggling that, you know, my, 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 my church support, my leader is here with me. And when I come out of session... Uh, no matter what state I'm in, they're going to be there for me too. Mm, mm. You know, and, and, you know, I, I think that's the best thing that we can do. We don't judge, we love on them, and we really show them how much we care by, by mm. being there. Uh, that's the best example in the New Testament when we look at Jesus of what he even did for people. He was yes. there. He absolutely was. Isn't that, oh my gosh. Amen. Well, I appreciate That's very helpful, very helpful for all of us, pastor, child, parent. Boy, you have Really bless us today, Edwina. What are some practical resources available, especially how people can find you uh, for someone who struggles, do you think, with anxiety? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, you know, um, unfortunately, each each state has their laws, right? I, I can't really take anybody uh, as a patient that's out of the state of Hawaii. But, you know, but I have a lot of things that are out there right now on social media that folks and different resources there that people can find. So um, my, my website, um, edwinareyes.com, uh, is, is, uh, that's spelled out E-D-W-I-N-A-R-E-Y-E-S.com. I have a lot of different kinds of four-minute video clips on different areas and topics that I think will be helpful for someone to seek out, as well as some um, blogs and articles that I have written. So also, I have an Instagram account as well, too, which is how we connected. Um, and that is Edwina Reyes MFT on Instagram. I can be found there as well as Facebook. And so resources there, um, I have a bunch of different things that people can find there. And then the other thing that folks can do is um, if they're really feeling like, okay, I think I'm ready to, to find a therapist or seek out counseling, even though they may not be able to come to me directly if they're out of the state of Hawaii, they can look on psychologytoday.com. And psychologytoday.com is a, is a really comprehensive um, website that folks can just put in their zip code and they can even select if they want a Christian counselor, what what kind of medical insurance they have, and then connect connect hmm. with folks that are near them. Good. Um, another practical resource that's great for folks out there, and some people, I find a lot of people have this, is the Calm app. Uh, Calm is a great app as well too where people really can practice the grounding, the mindfulness, being in the here and now. Um, Another thing that folks are uh, really, again, a really easy, uh, easy resource, there's a book um, that people can find on Amazon called The Anti-Anxiety Food Solution. Um, so again, if they're thinking about, okay, what do I eat? You know, like, how do I better my diet uh, so I can better my moods? Um, uh, that's a great resource right there. So Anti-Anxiety Food Solution by Trudy Scott. Um, so, and she talks about 
coffee and caffeine in there yes. as well, if you have any questions and comments I want to ask you, please leave them below. We're going to get back to you within a very reasonable amount of time and check out as well. You want to check out Edwina's contact information and her website, as well as check out our new blog and uh, by Dell Potter's adding to that weekly. You can go there at rftblog.com, right? Obvious, RFT, Reason for Truth, rftblog.com. Listen, until next time, make sure you do a few things. If you're listening on podcasts, I want to ask you, give us five stars on iTunes. We'd really appreciate that help spread the message. And if you're on a YouTuber, you know what I always say. Listen, like, share this, tell your friends, and tell your friends to subscribe. There's two things that are most important. You know what those are. Edwina, if you haven't heard it said before, number one, you subscribe. Number two, I always say give that little Sicilian hook. Boom, just knock that little bell out down there. Listen, that's going to go ding, ding. Listen, you got a new episode. Listen, I appreciate Edwina, you being on our, our program today. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo, and this is your reason for truth for today. Mm-hmm.